the gospel of the kingdom and cured every disease among the people. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that what had been said through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sit in darkness have seen a great light. On those dwelling in a land overshadowed by death, light has arisen. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. He said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. He walked along from there and saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. He went around all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and curing every disease and illness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. How about we start out with a story? Is that okay? Cool. Well, this is a story that requires audience participation. So let's practice it, shall we? Whenever I say, and the congregation cried out, you all say, Amen, or Amen, whichever. So let's try that. And the congregation cried out, Amen. Not bad. A preacher was winding up his temperance sermon with great fervor. If I had all the beer in the world, I'd take it and throw it into the river, he said. And the congregation cried out, Amen. And if I had all the wine in the world, I'd take it and throw it in the river. And the congregation cried out, Amen. And if I had all the whiskey and demon rum in the world, I'd take it all and throw it in the river. And the congregation cried out, Hallelujah. And the preacher sat down. Then the music director stood up and announced, for a closing song, let us sing hymn number 365, Shall We Gather by the River? <laughs> and the congregation cried out, <laughs> Ah, uh, not bad, is it? <laughs> well, anyway, what's that got to do with today's scriptures? Well, perhaps nothing. But then again, perhaps it does have something to say to us. Because in previous weeks, it, uh, we've been hearing and reading about the incredible preaching success of John the Baptist down by the River Jordan. But now, John has been arrested and thrown into a dungeon. And with the silencing of John's voice, the crowds disappeared as the people returned to their homes and businesses. So it's back to life as usual. That is, until we read today's gospel passage. And what an incredible gospel passage it is, because Matthew makes it sound so easy. Now the scriptures don't tell us how Jesus found out, but we do know from the text that the news of Jesus' arrest and imprisonment made a deep impression on him. And then in 12 short verses, 
Matthew takes Jesus from the back seat safety of the carpenter's shop to the front seat spotlight as the Messiah. And Matthew makes it sound so painless, so easy. So let me try to understand this. And you can listen in if you like, or you can take a nap if you've heard all of this before. I'll get the ushers to bring some cushions if you like. I suppose it all began innocently enough with Herod Antipas making a trip to Rome. Now, why he went doesn't matter, but what does matter is that while he was there, he met a girl. And the fact that the girl was the wife of his brother, as well as his niece, and the fact that he seduced her and ended up marrying her is what matters. Did you follow all of that? The Herod family tree is a nightmare to behold. Oh, and did I mention that Mr. Herod already had a wife back home that he had to divorce first? Hmm. Well, the whole thing broke every rule relating to marriage and family relations in the Jewish law books. However, all the Jewish law teachers knew enough to keep quiet and let Mr. Herod do pretty much what he wanted to do, whether they approved of it or not. So no one said a word. No one, that is, except John, and he said several words. Now Herod was not the kind of man to forget an enemy, and although it took him some time and some official excuse, the day came when he finally had John arrested. The official charge was the worry that John's influence was growing so great that he might lead the people to rebellion. But the real charge was airing Herod's family laundry in public without a license. For Herod, it was a pleasure. For John, it was a nightmare. He was placed in the prison of Macarius in the mountains east of the Dead Sea. The man who had wandered the deserts and open spaces preaching was now thrown into a sealed dungeon cell. How would he handle that? Well, I can imagine him thinking, Oh Lord, what have I got myself into? Now, I tell you all of this to lead up to one sentence. There comes a time when you are finally handed the keys. Now, it may sound like nonsense, but it's true. There comes a time when, with all your preparation, all your dreaming, all your planning, all your waiting comes to a crashing end, and everyone turns to you and says, all right, now it's your turn to drive. It's like any one of the young couples who come to me for marriage preparation. I've heard them say it. Oh, they say it all the time. They're ready for it. Bring on the lights, the cake, and the guests. They've planned for this day. They've dreamt of this day. They are ready. And then one day, she's walking down the aisle, and he's standing by the side of me waiting for his bride. And I look at their eyes, and there it is. Can I do this? Can I really do this? Where do I begin? What if it doesn't work out like we planned? Oh Lord, what have I got myself into? Or like the young couple who walk through the front door of their little house carrying their newborn baby daughter. They've prepared for this day. They've waited until they were finished with the college degrees and most of the loans were paid. They've read the books, attended the parenting and childbirth classes, and rented all the videos from the public library on parenting skills. They had talked about how they would make their decisions together and how they would not push their child like they had been pushed and had even fully stocked the nursery with everything that was necessary in preparation for this day. And they walk into the house, close the door, and stand in the middle of the living room holding a baby in their arms. Oh, and they're excited. But they're also wondering if they can really pull this off. I mean, can we do this? Can we really do this? Where do we begin? Will she like me? Will I be able to teach her anything? What if she gets sick? Can I handle that? Oh Lord, what have I got myself into? Or me. 
You know, when I arrived outside the seminary and saw it for the first time, boy, did I have a lot of questions, and I wondered. I'd been part of that parish momentum of parties and well wishes that build up around someone as they get ready to go off to the seminary. I'd also had the added momentum of a 2,200 mile drive from Tucson to Milwaukee. And suddenly there I was, parked by the side of the road, looking across at the seminary, full of questions. Would I like them? Would they like me? Could I handle the classes? Would I be able to pass the tests and the exams? Could I remember enough to be able to pass the message along? I was 44 years old at that day, and I was wondering if I could learn to study again after all those years out of a classroom. Could I really handle it? Oh Lord, what have I got myself into? So you see, I have to wonder, when he was handed the keys to take charge, if any of this went through Jesus' mind, because Matthew makes it sound so easy. And here in 12 short verses, Matthew takes Jesus from a safe second position to a preaching Messiah followed by four disciples and he makes it look painless. Now I'm not questioning Jesus' strength or his ability, but I wonder, I just wonder, since he was really one of us, if he looked at the new keys in his hand and wondered. It's a big decision to move from Nazareth to Capernaum. Now the distance between the two is geographically small, but the distance has to be measured in more than just miles. In Nazareth, he was home. His family was there for security. In small towns like Nazareth, no matter what else Jesus might do or say, he would always be Joseph's boy from down at the carpentry shop. And there was a security in the hometown advantage, even if it did cause problems for prophets. Also, Nazareth was fairly invisible. You could live there and preach there for a long time and never ever get quoted in the Tiberius Times. By the way, did you know that Nazareth is never ever mentioned, not once in the entire Old Testament? Did you know that? But Nazareth was, was there, and Nazareth was safe. But Capernaum, oh, Capernaum was visible. Capernaum was a good-sized fishing village on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, with highways running along the edge of town and a huge synagogue in the center. You could preach in Capernaum, be heard all the way to Jerusalem. In Capernaum, he would not be from the carpenter's shop. He would be from God. He would no longer be Joseph's boy, but would live and perhaps die as God's son. It was a long way from Nazareth to Capernaum, but I wonder if Jesus, when he heard the news about John, stood there in Nazareth looking eastward towards Capernaum, heard himself ask, could I do this? Can I really do this? Where do I begin? Oh Lord, what am I getting myself into? But moving to Capernaum wasn't the only question. What would he preach once he was there? Now he'd attended school at the Nazareth synagogue and he'd studied the law and the prophets. He'd also listened to John's message and agreed that it had to be continued. He was prepared to pick up John's word, words and add to them what only God's Son could add to them. But when Je John's voice was actually silenced in that prison cell and Jesus was actually handed the keys, I wonder if he wondered, as I would have wondered, can I do this? Can I really do this? If I preach these words, I will end up right where John ended up or worse. Perhaps, perhaps if I tempered it down a bit and just give people the warm fuzzies, I could get a nice pulpit in a synagogue in some quiet little village and let somebody else speak John's words. Oh Lord, what have I got myself into? And calling disciples, 
Oh, Matthew makes it sound so easy. It sounds easy for both Jesus and the new followers. But I have to wonder if it was really that easy. If Jesus called disciples, he was claiming to be someone worth following. Someone worth paying attention to. It would put him even more in that spotlight that, well, that spotlight that sometimes gets so bright, it burns you. I have to wonder if when he got up that morning and walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he was asking himself, can I do this? Can I really do this? Where do I begin? Will they really follow me? Can I really teach them anything? Oh, Father, what have I got myself into? And I wonder if Simon, Andrew, James and John asked the same thing. Matthew makes it all sound so easy. At once, he says, at once, immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And let's not forget here, they also left their families. A pretty good-sized fishing uh, business. They left their home, their boats, and whatever plans they had made for their future. So I have to wonder, as they followed him out of town, if they didn't sort of look at each other, sort of awkwardly, and think inside, can I do this? Can I really do this? Where is all this going to end up? What about the boats? What about the family? Oh Lord, what have I got myself into? Now, I have to be honest with you and admit that I don't know if any of these men ever questioned any of this. Matthew never hints that it happened at all. He does admit that Jesus asked a few questions later in the Garden of Gethsemane, but not now. So for those of you who feel I'm walking rather close to blasphemy with all of these ideas, well, you may be right. But I hope not. I hope that there were questions. I hope that the move from Nazareth to Capernaum was a difficult one. I hope that deciding what to preach was something that kept Jesus up late at night and woke him up early in the morning. I really hope that the decision to call disciples and to be disciples was frightening. And why? Because they did it anyway. They did it anyway. And that meant that the questions and the fear they bring did not have the power to stop them. And even here today, I find myself being stopped time and time again by the questions. Do I go here? Do I say this? Do I go along with that? Can I really teach them anything? What if they don't like me? Can I really pull this off? Where do I begin? Can I follow our Lord authentically and faithfully or not? Oh Lord, what have I got myself into? The trouble with scripture is that sometimes it sounds all too easy. But we know that being a Christian is not easy, is it? We know that the decision to follow Jesus is full of difficulties. And sometimes we feel forced to compromise a bit, just a little bit, just to get some peace. Well, John the baptizer did not compromise his message and he lost his head. And Jesus did not compromise his message and he died a horrible, cruel death on a cross. And most of his disciples were also killed because they too ultimately would not compromise God's message. And me? Well, I won't compromise God's message either. I can remain faithful to nothing if I can't remain faithful to that. But soon my voice will be silenced. No, I'm not going to be killed in some dungeon in the fortress of Macarius like my namesake was in the mountains east of the Dead Sea. No, instead, I am to return home to England and be retired in early March. But the message still exists. And there has got to be someone to carry it on. So now Jesus is asking you. Well, you are a Christian, aren't you? Someone has to stand up against the Herods of this day to protect the lives of the unborn. Someone has to tell the politicians that all human life is sacred. 
Someone has to speak out for the poor, the abused, and the exploited. Someone has to stand up and defend the teaching of the church against those who seek to destroy it. Someone has to protect our children and show them how to live by Christian principles and morals. Someone has to expose hypocrisy and blow the whistle on dishonest deals. Someone has to tell the sinner that they are loved by God and that the only path to wholeness is through sincere repentance. Someone has to carry the light of Christ to the many good people who still live in darkness. So now it's your turn. Come and follow me, he says. What? Are you afraid that it may not be as easy as it sounds? Do you have some questions too? How do those keys feel in your hand, eh? Are you wondering too? Well, welcome to the club. Oh Lord, what have I got myself into? Amen. <laughs>